Hello and welcome to interest.co.nz. I'm Gareth Vaughan and I'm joined by Nirmal Nair, who is a senior lecturer at Auckland University uh, at the Department of Electrical Engineering and uh, Computing, I believe. Um, thanks for your, your time, Nirmal. Um, Nirmal's um, here to talk about a report that he and a couple of other people from Auckland University have done recently. It's entitled Measuring the Solar Potential of a City and its Implications on Energy Policy. And they've used as their case study Auckland, um, their hometown. Um, so so it's of a lot of interest, um, I think, in terms of uh, Auckland's future plans around energy and indeed how the city builds um, in terms of the unitary plan debate as well. Um, thanks for, for joining us, um, uh, Nirmal. Um, thanks. First of all, do you want to just tell us um, in terms of uh, who, who the other authors of the report are as well and uh, why you guys did this um, report? Right. Um, so the history goes back in 2011, actually. Um, so June, July of 2011, that's two years uh, before. Um, there was a couple of uh, interesting scenarios which was playing out at that part, part, point of time uh, here in Auckland, as well as uh, globally as well. Um, in Auckland, uh, we, were, we had formed the super city at that point of time. And um, there was a consolidation process going on uh, within the process level. And um, um, so that was one thing. And internationally, uh, we were just uh, in the midst of our ongoing part of the GFC. So you had a lot of um, QE investments and QE2 investments uh, floating around. And uh, interestingly, internationally, we looked at a lot of these investments um, in smart grid technologies, clean technologies. Uh, electric vehicles, solar PVs, and things like that. Uh, so that was the context um, externally and within uh, the city. Uh, we at University of Auckland then uh, uh, decided that it's time for us to do an interdisciplinary project. Uh, where uh, So one of the authors, uh, the lead authors, is Hugh Bard. He is um, actually an architect with an interest in urban policy. Uh, we had an economist, Basil Sharp, uh, from economics, and uh, he's a well-renowned uh, resource economist working in water. And uh, myself from uh, the electrical and computer engineering, more broadly the faculty of engineering as the energy theme leader. And um, my background is in power systems, electrical engineering. So we thought it was a good idea to kind of uh, brainstorm around um, Auckland. Uh, what its energy policy decisions are going to be, uh, more in the medium to long term, um, so 10 to 20 years, 30 years, looking at technologies, looking at the issue, looking at the potential, and we thought solar was an option which uh, where we all felt strongly about, and we thought we will uh, start this project and see where it goes. And uh, we had a couple of other people uh, to mention here, uh, Anna Ho, who was uh, Hugh Byard's um, uh, research student, and Dr. Moman from the Power System Group. And look, you, you've, you've come up with some very interesting stuff. I mean, basically, one of the, uh, probably the key conclusion um, is that um, low-dense suburbia is the most efficient collector of solar energy and could produce enough excess energy to, uh, well, could generate enough excess energy through this method to power daily transport needs and contribute to peak daytime electrical loads in the, in the city centre. So this is this is interesting. I guess if we just start off, in terms of the, how come uh, low dense suburbia is the, is the best, produces the most solar power? Right. Uh, so when uh, we started this exercise, we started looking at a unit, basically. So we tried, started to define units. And the unit for us was households. Um, so because that's how the transaction mechanism of energy costs plays out. Um, so in, and then Hugh went and did an architectural exercise from the census data to do with buildings and, and, and so on. So, so the smallest common denominator unit is households. Um, so when we did that exercise, we quickly found out that the suburbia has, um, uh, because we had a cross-section area from the center of the city, CBD, 10 kilometers outwards. So in a suburb, let's say like New Lynn, which is kind of around the 10 kilometer mm. suburb area, the density was cut up around 14 to 15 households. And then we move somewhere in, internally, we come to uh, Mount Eden, which is 25, 30. And then we come to the CBD, which is around 1,000 dwellings and so on. So, so you could clearly see what the built environment was at that point of time. 
And so since household was uh, the common denominator unit, so then we had to ask the question, if someone is going to invest in a solar panel, it has to go to be this household. So, so that was how, how it played out. And when we looked at the statistics, we found out, uh, looking at the roof area, the inclination, and the best position for the solar panels, the tills, the northeast, northwest, the shadings, and, and, and a whole bunch of other parameters. Uh, the report really talks at length about how we did this calculation. Uh, we ended up with, um, uh, you know, the outer suburbia area with a, with a better span of capturing the solar potential which is out there. And, and in terms of, of just how much solar uh, power, solar energy could be produced if, if you, you had PVs on all these rooftops, uh, suburban rooftops around Auckland, I mean, just how much are we talking about? And what particular conditions does Auckland have um, that are good for this type of, of um, energy? Right. Or to um, produce this type of energy? Right. Uh, so the, this, um, this research would look most only at the potential part of it. So uh, before we picked up uh, solar as a, as a technology option for energy, we looked at uh, what Auckland's uh, profiles are for, for, um, uh, on an annualized basis. We quickly realized uh, we, we were doing international benchmarks. We were not comparing ourselves with, let's say, Nelson or, or, or uh, other or cities, Hawks Bay or, or, Hawks Bay or anything yeah. like that. We were looking at, let's say, Madrid, where there was a lot of investments um, uh, into, into clean technologies there. Solar was one of the options. Germany. Uh, and, and cities in Germany, uh, and uh, even LA, we looked at LA uh, as an example, um, where there was um, um, incentives put, um, like feed-in tariff and, and, and artificial incentives put to encourage solar. Um, but in all these places, we found Auckland had one of the best uh, weather patterns uh, from viewpoint of solar potential. So it stacks up pretty well compared internationally. So we have the potential out there. Uh, the next question which you asked was about okay how would, how did we do how much um, you know how much in each rooftops and what the potential was uh, so we looked at the best sites basically so in these numbers where we come up with um, um, uh, the 45 degree tilt uh, the 95 percent profile so we are not really talking about covering up the mm. whole rooftops or anything like that the best potential because we had an economist on board yeah. was closely watching what the economics of this might turn out to be um, so uh, so yes it, it can and theoretically, you know, if, if every household in the suburb did do that, and um, and, and we also looked at what the pat patronage of this would be, uh, that these householders uh, would they be working at their home, or would they be, uh, is it a two, um, if it's a family of two who are going to work, so their their consumption is pretty low. So we got consumption data from brands and things like that. So we really found out that in the suburbia, in the in the case study which we did. Um, the loads were less and uh, you had enough um, excess energy if the whole rooftop um, uh, coverage was uh, extracted. And d did you break it down to the extent of which suburbs were best suited to uh, having solar PVs on their, on their uh, roofs? Uh, no, we did not. Uh, we had, um, I'm just taking from my notes, uh, we had Mount Eden, Sandringham and Newlyn because it was arterially yep. this way. And uh, we did CBD, and uh, we did look at all the rooftops, typical rooftops, because we had an architect on board. Mm. Uh, so he classified uh, and um, detached home, semi-detached home, a terrace, uh, and then the CBD. We looked at shadow effects from uh, nearby. You know, um, so we looked at all that. We concentrated only on the roof. We did not concentrate on the, in the vertical walls and things like that, because we had once again we had an architect on board. Uh, there was aesthetics into it. We, we, we put all those features into consideration um, so yes so that's what it stacks out and in the paper we clearly show what the potential is and it really strikes out and in terms of the PV units I mean obviously they are getting more popular um, mm. these days and, and the costs have come down but I, I guess I'm wondering I mean are, are they at a point now where they are accessible for the average person uh, they are accessible for the average person in this particular study we assume just an efficiency of 12 percent for instance, which was, we, we were trying to, uh, and that was the electrical side of uh, the equation. So we looked at all the losses, um, the inverter losses, um, all the losses associated with the overall runtime efficiency of solar, and we were talking about 12% or something like that, uh, which is pretty low, people would argue, but then that's what its reality is. So uh, we didn't dig further into the economics of that aspect yet. 
um, because uh, we were just at that point of time we were just looking at the potential aspect rather than extracting that energy out so we stopped at that point of time uh, but we did some rough calculation with 3.5 kilowatt um, uh, 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 potential of solar PV in, in, in each of these households and uh, the, the, the paper kind of shows uh, how that, uh, uh, that comes out to be. These are very strong assumptions, I do agree, uh, but uh, that we, we just looked at it from, a, uh, from an energy perspective. And you've, you've talked about having enough power left over to, to, to power electric vehicles. I mean, are you primarily talking about cars there and, and that type of...? Yes. Um, so one of the... Uh, we kind of also speculated because it was in the medium to long term horizon. So we told what is the other technology which can actually feed the load? Because the macro situation of electricity here in New Zealand is 75% um, uh, um, um, green. Um, so the grid part is clearly clean and green, so uh, the feed-in tariff was not um, a, 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 a thing which we think would happen or would happen in the future. So that was out of the game, so uh, we had to really look at what the new load is going to be because the existing system is already there. So one of the options we thought was in the medium to long term there might be more households coming that could be one part of the load, but uh, we still did not think that th that was a game changer. So in the paper, we explored the possibility that electric vehicles or electric cars uh, would uh, is there, and we can supply the electric cars, uh, and if the suburban has a potential of doing that. And um, we also, by that time, there was discussion about the inner city loop and Auckland loop yeah. and, and issues around that. So then we kind of thought, oh, the inner city can be handled by electric uh, traction. But externally, if um, you know a family of uh, a family uh, who is working, they might not be their lifestyle choices would be such that uh, they would not be during the peak hours of the day, and the, it it could charge their vehicle there, and they might use public transport. So there's a whole, lot of assumptions which yeah. you are building into it. But electric car was the load option which we chose to. Okay. Uh, do the, the council is bringing in electric trains too but in terms of cars i mean what's your take on where the development of electric cars are, is at at the moment and the the batteries and and i guess the cost of them and the feasibility of them as a as a long-term option right um so uh, once again um uh, when we started out we were very optimistic because 2011 was um you know the year of the teslas and 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 and, and a whole bunch of ev uh, options out there um, so we did some quick analysis. Battery was a big cost uh, uh, aspect to that, uh, but there were different models. Uh, we looked at some model in Israel where uh, they were actually going to, um, uh, the, the battery itself was going to be kind of a, a product which was being sold and things like that. So. Uh, so without speculating too much, we knew that the battery cost was going to be the big issue there. Um, so we haven't considered, you know, any any details further there. It's a big, uh, big unknown whether it's going to come or not. Um, but um, uh, but looking at the Tesla examples and things like that, it's practically possible. Uh, it's just the cost uh, and the price aspect of, of the car of the batteries. Uh, but uh, we are pretty optimistic as well. There was a whole bunch of uh, research going around battery uh, aspects these days. So in the medium to long term, uh, we are still optimistic. Okay, and and obviously in. Uh, your, your paper comes at a very interesting time in, in Auckland in the sense of the, the unitary plan which has been very thoroughly debated in, in recent months um, with Auckland Council talking about a more compact city, more people living more in, in apartments, high-rise buildings and obviously the government sort of pushing back on that a bit and wanting to open up Greenfield's land for more development. To what extent is, do you think these issues you've raised around energy are being taken into account in this planning and, and I mean clearly it's a pretty important factor that, that should be taken into account isn't it? Um, uh, coming from an energy perspective I would say it's important um, but um, we had um, Hugh Byrd who had interest in urban policy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, we, when uh, the economist, the architect, and the electrical engineer sat across a table and discussed research ideas, we thought optimization is the best way to go proceed further. Uh, it has to be a value proposition. Um, and um, we felt uh, the consensus was, yes, this should be looked at. And uh, when we are talking about the 10-year time frame or the 20-year time frame or even a generational time frame of the electric vehicle class, Definitely, we should be looking at this from that aspirational aspect as well. And um, so it should be one part of it, 
uh, that that's our consensus. And at the end of the day, as, uh, uh, in your intro piece, you told we were all Aucklanders, uh, so we thought uh, we had a stake in that, and 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 there was a vested interest in that aspect. We wanted to do the city the right choice, the right decision, uh, because we were comparing some of the best cities in the world. So we were comparing with Vancouver, yeah. we were comparing with Sydney, and if you look at some of their plans, they are really talking about 30, 50 years energy plans. Mm. And um, coming back to energy a little bit, so that because it, it really hits into the unitary plan in that sense, if you look at Auckland as a city and look at what its energy consumption is, uh, be it electricity, be it gas, uh, be it um, you know, the petroleum products to run our cars, uh, we are importing all of them. That is the reality. Mm. Um, so, therein lies the question, uh, can we be a little bit of a producer? And solar sprang out neatly and clearly. So we are saying uh, from a resilience aspect, because some of the energy network resilience aspect is because of the network resilience. In 1998, we had a blackout that was more of a transportation problem, electricity transportation problem. Yeah. We had a gas issue. So energy should be looked at if Auckland is trying to grow. Definitely. Uh, so that should be part of the equation. In, But how it plans out, when to step, when to have this green flail, and so on, I personally don't have a particular opinion about it because I really don't know about town planning and things like that. But definitely, if you're looking at it from a unit planning viewpoint and so on, uh, my sense would be that um, it should be taken into consideration, maybe maybe at the third level of optimization, constraint problem for that. Well, thanks a lot for that. That's Nirmal Nair, who is a professor of electrical engineering, electrical engineering and computing at uh, the University of Auckland. And I'm Gareth Vaughan at interest.co.nz.